meeting host. Ask Leon Hermans for permission to record to my device. <laughs> yeah, I'll. I'll uh... I am now recording the session. Okay. To the cloud to my Zoom cloud. So yeah. Okay, then uh, I'm going to start. Um, uh, welcome you everybody to this. Um, a webinar of the our Transpath Plan Project of 15 April 2024. Good to see you all. Um, I also see that we have some new names uh, amongst us, uh, Fina and uh, Vidas. Uh, welcome you both uh, to the project and to this webinar series, which we are hosting on a monthly basis. And today we have our friends from the Brahmaputra River Basin node and um, in their research, they focus on inland water transport between India and Bangladesh, which is also very much re represented as a hallmark of local or regional cooperation between the countries. And well, uh, Anamika and her team are doing research on this potential of this inland water transport system to uh, catalyze transformative change within and amongst the basin communities. and by analyzing the socio-economic uh, dynamics and the environmental sustainability of it. Enough said by me. Thank you everybody for joining us. And then I would like to give the floor to the Brahmaputra note. And um, thank you. looking forward. Thank you, Jak. Thank you for the introduction. So um, we have four presenters, but we'll be quick. We thought to keep it inclusive, so we brought everybody on board. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is quickly share the screen and what we are uh, just, I hope you can see my screen, right? Okay, so um, so as you can uh, see here on the slide, and as you have mentioned, uh, the focus of the Brahmaputra node is on inland water transport, focusing on two countries, that is Bangladesh and India and on a river basin, which is called the Brahmaputra River Basin. I'm going to talk more about what this river basin is like. And um, what we are trying to see is, of course, whether this intervention on the river basin between these two uh, important South Asian countries, is it leading to a transformative change? What you see here on the picture is a picture from Majuli, uh, which we took when we went for the field work. And, um, uh, so this is also the place where we plan to bring you for the uh, field work when you come here in December. And the river is the Brahmaputra River from the India side. Um, okay, so before I go into the presentation, I thought it is uh, important to introduce everyone to the Brahmaputra Node team. And as you can see, IIT Gohati is taking the lead in this project and uh, with me, uh, Mizo, Gittima, and Jaya are working on this project. We have two regional partners. We have Joydeep as a media partner and Sumit as knowledge partner. Then we also have partners in India and Bangladesh who are a part of the Brahmaputra node. Uh, Dr. Partha is uh, uh, heading an organization called Aranyak in India, which, is, which focuses uh, mostly on the environment and climate change issues. And in Bangladesh, we have uh, Zakir from JJS and we have Malik Fida from CEGIS. They are both going to help us at uh, the field work and also in the policy assessment part. Uh, we have Dr. Veena, who is from Cuts International, and she is basically going to work across the India and the Bangladesh part. So for us, Veena is the regional partner within the Brahmaputra node. Uh, so just one thing that I wanted to add is that today what we are presenting is in contribution from the entire team. Um, okay, now moving on, the river basin that I was talking about, which we are calling it as Brahmaputra River Basin, but the, the name is very long. It is called Yalong Sangpo in China. It is called Brahmaputra in India, and it is called Jamuna in actually Bangladesh. It also falls, the Brahmaputan also falls in the catchment of um, Brahmaputra River Basin. And uh, it, there are two tributaries which joins the river. And that is why we call it that the river is shared by China, India, Bhutan, and Bangladesh. It's an interesting river basin because uh, you know that 
most of these South Asian countries has a huge population. And the, the, the river, when it flows through these uh, different communities, the, the community's livelihood depends a lot on this river. Uh, particularly agriculture plays a very, very important role. And there are also pockets of community which are still uh, not very well off in terms of economic uh, you know, conditions. So poverty seems to be and continues to be a major challenge uh, for the community residing on this river basin. The river is also interestingly known as river of sorrow and opportunity. Sorrow because uh, there are yearly uh, devastating floods which takes away lives and livelihood. It's earlier it used to be only a yearly flood, but now with climate change, it has moved. It has become much more recurrent. And every time this flood comes in, uh, there is a lot of economic loss, social loss, psychological impact to people. Um, An opportunity because the river also provides a lot of opportunity which are not entirely explored, but it has a lot of hydropower potential. It has a lot of navigation potential, which is also a case that we are going to study. Uh, so we call it therefore the river, uh, the water or this river actually has an enormous potential as well to bring a lot of prosperity to the community who depends on this river. However, every, every country sharing this river basin has diverse you know, interests. So that has been a big challenge to bring countries together into one platform and identify how we can jointly invest on this river basin. And this has been made even more difficult because there are several bilateral uh, you know, MOUs that exist between, for example, China, India, Bangladesh, China, India, Bhutan, India, Bangladesh, but we don't have anything which brings all the four countries together. Uh, and also this, this river basin continues to be uh, kind of an under-researched river basin compared to other South Asian river basins such as Ganges and Indus. But yes, we do see that in the last uh, you know, decade, there is a lot of interest on the river basin. We are also seeing some investment coming on and there are, there are interests from the countries and the governments as well. Now, in this context, it was very interesting for us to actually explore this very, uh, you know, and this actually a renewed intervention, I would say, because inland water transport between India and Bangladesh, uh, there was already a trade agreement which was signed between these two countries in 1972. And the idea was, of course, this, 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 uh, this whole channel of navigation will help in uh, moving uh, lots of goods and services. But due to several political uh, issues between 2001 and 2015, uh, it stopped. So, the, so there was uh, nothing happening for those many years. But in 2015, uh, uh, there was conversation between the governments of the country, a renewed interest, and they also decided that we should renew this contract and this renewal, the way they did it that for five successive years, it will go on automatically, it will get renewed unless a particular government of any country raise any objection. And during this time, they also decided, the country, the governments also decided that they, there needs to be some addendum to the uh, old protocol. There were several meetings, two of the meetings, one happened in New Delhi in India and another in Dhaka in 2019. Uh, what uh, came out of these meetings and what addendum we see is that there has been extension of the protocol routes, there are inclusion of new routes, and also declaration that new ports uh, would be developed. Uh, there was emphasis on what kind of vessels would be allowed to be moving on the international river. And I specifically bring this up because this matters a lot when we will be presenting to you the cases, uh, the case studies. And also a very important thing is that how can we make these, uh, you know, transportation between India and Bangladesh, movement of goods between England, England and uh, Bangladesh, less bureaucratic, less difficult. And so how can we improve the customs and immigration procedures? So these were some of the important points that were emphasized and discussed and so that this particular intervention can become much more successful than what we have seen uh, in the past. Now, just to very quickly tell you that why this river, particularly Brahmaputra River, is an interesting case is because, as you can see in the uh, left side of the uh, diagram, that the, there are several 111 national waterways uh, that India has. But NW2, which is the Brahmaputra uh, River, it actually connects to Bangladesh. So what you see on the other side of the, on this diagram, uh, from Sadia is the point, it actually connects from here, this is the border, uh, 
uh, port between India and Bangladesh. It moves down, and here you see India Bangladesh uh, protocol route. But this is the this is the route that our study is focusing on, and we plan to focus on four cases: two in India and two in Bangladesh. Uh, two in India is Majuli and Thuburi, and two in Bangladesh is Chilmari and Sirajganj. And the reason why we picked these up is that you would see that. While Dhuburi is a place where a lot of offloading and uploading of uh, goods happen, Majuli is another interesting case because this protocol agreement also talks about passenger, uh, you know, cruises, for example, cross-border cruise. So how the cross-border cruise can actually enhance livelihood was the reason why we picked up Majuli. And, um, and two uh, uh, case studies in Bangladesh, they are all very, very close to where the uh, border is. Um, today in our presentation, we are going to talk about Dhuburi and Majuli as the Bangladesh uh, case study, uh, the field visit is uh, going to happen from the month of, I think around in the month of May or June, so that when next time we can present to you the Chilmari and Chiranjit case. So this is the background based on which we started this work. I'm now going to hand it over to Sumit, who is going to tell us how we are planning to do this. What's the methodology or what's the research design around this, uh, this uh, study? But what overall we are trying to understand is that uh, the larger question that we are actually trying to research around is that can inland water transport bring transformative changes in the basin community across gender, class, religion, and environment? And at the same time, ensuring that it is inclusive, transparent, and, the, and, it, and it takes up a participatory uh, approach. So over to you, Sumit. Thanks, Anamika. Uh, very quickly, I'll uh, keep it short uh, today because we have two more speakers coming in. Um, my uh, idea was to tell a bit more about uh, <clears throat> uh, how do we operationalize the, the key question that Anamika just raised. So what we are doing right now is like we, in the last uh, few months, uh, we created an analytical framework uh, on transformation. Um, what we basically did is to not focus so much on what, why, uh, of the transformation because Anamika already mentioned that we are looking the whole aspect of inland water transport as a possible transformation in the Brahmaputra Basin and how it could change lives or not. That is also one of the key elements that what is not transformative about this whole uh, intervention that is being proposed uh, to bring cooperation between the different countries. But the idea was to also think of how do we bring this transformation and for whom, that was a key question that we focused on. I'm not gonna go into the detail of the framework that we created, it's called the Spirit Framework, which I discussed in the Mexico workshop. And also I'm gonna talk about a bit more in the uh, in the PhD and postdoc forum this week. Um, so there will be a bit more details on this particular framework and how do we analyze and look at the existing uh, policies, whether they are talking about transformation or not. So we are going to look into that. But in terms of the re real uh, field work and uh, to understand what has happened, we had two broad methods to understand this. First one, of course, the policy document analysis, where the policy assessment comes and the spirit framework comes in. So look at the gaps uh, in the existing policies. Uh, a lot of government, uh, quite a few government policy documents, or at least their public uh, outreach has been that the inland water transfer will bring transformation. But in practice, in reality, in the policy documents, uh, we wonder whether there is or not. Uh, we don't want to make a judgment simply based on what is said in these political statements. So we are going to go a step back and make this assessment, whether they are talking about the scalar or scalability of these policies, whether they are power inclusive or not, we're looking into the temporality angle of how long are they talking about when they're proposing interventions around inland water transport. So all those aspects will be looked into in quite detail. The second, which is the core of uh, the work uh, in terms of on the ground realities is the critical living labs, which is more based on action research and kind of capturing what is really needed by the people or the voices that are not yet heard. So you will hear in the coming slides from Jaya as well as Mizo 
that in the two sites in India, in um, in Majuli and Dubri, whose voices are not yet heard and what kind of challenges exist there. So we kind of did a reconnaissance visits in those two places. The details will be shared in the coming uh, slides by the two, two uh, researchers, uh, Mizo and Jaya. I will not go into that, but I will quickly mention that how did we operationalize it uh, in, in a couple of minutes. So what we did is in the last, uh, in, in 2023, we made uh, these visits, but, uh, and try to identify what are the key gaps or challenges that are yet not being addressed by the inland water transport uh, policy domain. They are making these big claims that there will be trade and all sorts of things, but what are the key challenges for the people on the ground? Uh, there are these small boat dwellers. Uh, there are these uh, people who are working on the on the ports. What kind of challenges exist for them? Uh, how can we say that they are transformative in nature? So we'll look into that. Um, and also, this will not be the end of it. Uh, the idea is to identify those gaps which we have identified. You will hear about them in the coming slides. But somehow find these low-hanging fruits, which we in the next two years, at least within this project uh, boundaries, we could make those interventions and bring those agendas on board with the state or with other actors that are responsible for this. I will stop here very quickly. Um, I think it will be Jaya next who will talk about Dhubri. And uh, Jaya, it's over to you now. Thank you, Sumit. Um, hello, everyone. So as Sumit already mentioned that we have already done our reconnaissance survey in our two study site. So first we uh, went to Dhubri. So uh, in Dhubri, we visited last year uh, from 12 to 14 December, and there we interacted with IWI officials, some private company representative, Fisher Folk Boat Association members, Indian traders, Bangladeshi traders, and Char residents. So Char is a localized term that is used for the riverine island. Because of its geographic location, it is they, the chars are prone to erosion and submersion during floods. So the char communities, they are very essential part of the our study because they are the most vulnerable one. So first visit we did in Dubri. And the second visit we did in Marjuli. We went to Marjuli in February. And there we interacted with the local communities, which includes the village headmen, char community, fisher folks, and government officials. So I will give more emphasis on the Dhubri. So before going into the detail, I would like to set up a small over, overall overview of Dhubri. So it's geographic and demographic position. Dhubri is a key district in Assam because it is a gateway to both interstate and intrastate border of Assam. And it's also shared international border with Bangladesh. And because of this, there are many native and migrant community who lives in Dhubri. Second is its economy. Dubri's economy is primarily dependent on agriculture. Although there are people who work as a daily wage labor, some of them also owns very small shop. But overall, uh, in industrial development, Dubri is uh, very backward. There is no industrial development and because of which Dubri is a poor state in Assam. Next is its ecology. Uh, Dubri has quite rich uh, biodiversity, especially in terms of fishes. There are dolphins which are found in the Brahmaputra River and they are very important species because they are considered as the uh, indicators of the river health. But the most important characteristic of Dubri is its inland water navigation. So why it is very important? Because there are two ports in Dubri. First is international port and second is domestic, domestic ports. So as in this map, you can see the green square box. This is the Dhubri port. And at the uh, corner, you can see a red triangle, which is the Chilmari, which is the Bangladesh uh, international port, uh, Chilmari. And the, this red lines, it represent the trade that is happening between India and Bangladesh. Apart from this, you can see there are many thinner lines who are, uh, you know, spread all over. So these lines shows the domestic port, domestic trade, which is happening within the Assam from Dubri. And from Dubri, these trade are taking place from, uh, with Meghalaya as well. Meghalaya is a neighboring state of Assam in the Northeast India. So there are two ports in uh, Dubri and two type of trade dynamic is happening in Dubri. So first, I will like to give an uh, uh, idea about what is happening in the international port. So during our first day visit in the field, we went to the international port. 
uh, where we interacted with the government officials, uh, private entity and the traders. And we made our observations as well. So, from, uh, so fr from our study side, we found some interesting aspect. First is the trade commodity. So at present, during the time of the study, only two commodities were being transported from that port. That was the coal and the stone. And however, this port is open to uh, to do trade with other form of other commodities as well, but it is not happening at that time. So there is a less diversification. So while interacting with one of the Bangladeshi trader, he mentioned that maybe there are chances that from the Bangladesh side, the demand is lower. That is why this port is not dealing with other commodities. However, we are not very sure of it because we have not made our visit uh, to the Bangladesh yet. So in future, we are definitely going to look into this aspect. The second uh, important interesting development that has happened in the Dhubri port is its privatization. So in 2023, the government of India has leased out this port to a private company company uh, for five years on the basis of operation and management. This is a public-private partnership model. And uh, in this model, the private entity holds the 60% of the share and the government uh, owns the 40% of the share. And because of its PPP mode, its governance structure is also quite interesting. The, the A committee has been formed where there are the representatives from private company, IWI officials, custom officials, and, and uh, traders as well. Uh, the, there is a clear-cut demarcation between the role and responsibilities of private entity and the government. So that the private entity is responsible for taking care of all the activities which is related to the trade, that is loading and unloading, whereas the government's responsibility is to manage the channel which are used for navigation to a depth of 2.5 meters. Uh, after privatization, a lot of challenges has arisen in the international court. So I'll discuss each of them one by one. So first one is the tariff uh, hike. So uh, before privatization, the government used to charge a tariff of rupees 75 rupees per ton for the stones. And after privatization, Privatization, this tariff has increased to rupees 335 rupees. So there is a huge increase in the tariff price. And because of this, the Dhubri, overall the trade in the Dhubri has gone down. So as per the data which we received from the field was that in 2022, the trade, the volume of the trade that took place from the port was 1.5 million ton. However, in 2023, it reduced to 20,000 tons. Uh, so when we were in the field, we observed that a kind of a negotiation was going on between the traders and the private company because of the increased tariff, these private traders, they were not happy at all. And a continuous dialogue was going on between both of them. So after this negotiation, the company, they had, they reduced their tariff price. They reduced it to 225 rupees. And they clearly mentioned that this is the lowest tariff that they can provide to the traders. They cannot go beyond that. And uh, although they have reduced the tariff price, but still it is much higher than what the government used to charge. The third challenge is the poor infrastructure. Previously, when IWI was taking care of the port, so they installed a conveyor belt, which used to facilitate the loading and unloading activities quite smoothly at the port. And after privatization, the belt was removed. And since then, the operational efficiency of the port has gone down. So when we were in the field, we saw that there were four or five Bangladeshi vessels were standing there from the past four or five days. Until then, they were not loaded. So when we were having the conversation with the Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi traders, they mentioned that because of this poor operational efficiency at the port, their overall businesses also suffers. And the last observation uh, which we made uh, in context of the challenge was the relationship with the trader. We observed that this private entity, they are not able to build that interpersonal relationship with the traders. And uh, one of the reason could be is the language because um, the trader speaks Assamese and all the employees of the private company are not from the Assam. So they cannot speak Assamese. So there was this lack of the uh, interpersonal relationship. However, this trader uh, had a good interpersonal relationship with the IWA, uh, AI officials because they were they were able to speak in SMEs. 
So these are the uh, our insights from our first day field visit. On the second day of the field visit, we visited to the domestic port. And in the domestic port, we were actually quite surprised to see the kind of the activities that were happening. The port was very busy, unlike the international port. There were passenger boats, there was these trading boat, a lot of loading and unloading of items like potato, beet, uh, spices, all these were happening. So the port was very busy. So we moved ahead and we interacted with the local traders who were involved in this um, activity. We interacted with them. Uh, we wanted to know their perspective on this inland water transport, how they understand it, what are the problems they face. So uh, while interacting with them, we came to know that they, these local traders, they are very keen to do this trade in international waters. However, they are unable to do it because of the licensing requirement. <clears throat> So in India, we have an Indian Vessel Act 1917. And as per this act, there are only certain kind of the vessels who are allowed to go to the international port and do the business. And these small boats, which these local trader owns, they do not fall in that category. Hence, they have been refrained from doing the business in the international water. But interestingly, although there is this formal uh, restriction in the trade, uh, informal trading is happening between India and the Bangladesh. So what exactly is happening is all these items, which, whatever are being transported from the Dhubri port, they are going to the local areas like Mankachar and other local ports. But these Mankachar and these local ports, they are closer to the Bangladesh border. So from there, these items are eventually going to the Bangladesh, but through the informal channel. And uh, because, uh, but there is no accounting of this uh, this uh, trade so we are not very sure that what exactly is the volume of the trade that is happening because of this informal trade thing and then the last uh, observation which we made in the field was there were no female trader neither in international uh, port not in the domestic port so while we were having the conversation with the local trader they mentioned that there is a woman who lives in Dauki, Meghalaya. She is the women trader we came across. And we have planned that in our next field visit, we are definitely going to meet her. And we will try to bring her perspective related to this inland water transport into our study. So apart from these international and local uh, trade dynamic, an interesting infrastructure development is taking place in Dhubri, that is the construction of the bridge. So a bridge is under the construction, as you can see in this picture, this bridge has already been constructed to some extent. So this bridge will connect Dhubri in Assam to uh, Fulbari in Meghalaya and lots and lots of positive hopes has been attached to this bridge. Like it will improve the connectivity, it will uh, reduce the travel time, it will bring the regional integration because Assam and Meghalaya, these two states, they are quite rich in their own culture. So with this bridge will help to, you know, uh, integrate these uh, cultural diversity uh, among each other. But one of the negative aspects that is also associated with this bridge is once the bridge is ready and it's operational, so there are very high chances that the trade which is happening through the river might shift into the road-based trade. And if this happens, these local traders' business future is it's it's quite high quite high in risk. So after spending the two days in our field, we these are the uh, problems we uh, found, and we also identified the two low hanging fruits in Dubri. So first one is as I uh, earlier mentioned, because of the licensing requirement, these traders are unable to operate formally in international water. So we are planning to set up a dialogue with the government. So where we would like to advocate with the government to bring some form of flexibility in this Indian vessel act, so that these boat operators who are who cannot do the international trade in the uh, international trade can also come in under the uh, umbrella of this uh, act and can also operate. So this will, uh, you know, improve the inclusivity of the uh, act as well. And to do this, we will, uh, the Cuts International, who is our regional partner, we will take help from them because they have been advocating about it since long back and they have done a good amount of groundwork, which is definitely going to help us. 
second is we observe that there is a communication gap between india and bangladeshi traders there is no platform where they both can come and meet and discuss so we are planning to set up an informal platform where the traders from both India and Bangladesh can come. They can discuss the uh, demand from both the side and how they can uh, you know, uh, meet this demand. So this informal platform will not only enhance the trade dynamics, it will also increase the cooperation between these two countries in the BRB region. So we have identified these two fruits and in the future we are going to look into these aspects more deeply. Uh, now from here I will hand over the presentation to Mizo who will explain our next study site that is Majuli. Thank you. Yeah, thank you Jaya. So moving on to our next field site which is Majuli. Majuli is a, a uh, large island in the Brahmaputra River in Naza is one of the economically poor states in Assam. Assamese communities along with the tribal communities and uh, other marginalized communities reside there. Uh, uh, the local economy basically re revolved around the uh, agriculture activities, agriculture uh, and allied activities. Uh, primarily fishing, uh, marginal communities do commercial fishing, and some uh, most of the households are involved in the substance fishing. And the unique geography of Majuli is endowed with a rich aquatic life and a rich uh, bird population, uh, and it's also susceptible to annual floods and the violated at south. Uh, Majuli carries a unique culture, heritage, a suite of neo Islamic movement, believing in a casteless and egalitarian society, worshipping Lord Krishna. Uh, inland water transport is uh, very much tied with the daily lives of the local communities in terms of uh, employment, education, and accessing health services. And the inland water transport is very important for Majuli, uh, not only because of the dependence of the local community, it's also, it's also uh, because like Majuli has an important ancient body as a tourism industry, local tourism industry. Uh, as you can see in the map, the cross border uh, river cruise operates from a city called Varanasi in Andhra Indian states to Uttar Pradesh uh, and it crosses India and then enters ben uh, Bangladesh and it finally carries a increasing number of domestic and international tourists to Madhuri. So moving on to the uh, uh, insights from the fieldwork, our fieldwork pointed uh, towards the livelihood crisis of local communities. So first I will discuss the case of Fisherfolk. Fisherfolk are mostly belongs to marginalized caste and uh, because of the dwindling fishing population and disappearing water bodies, the fishing is no more as a viable livelihood option. As a result, youth are migrating out of Majuli and uh, the Elders are moving to other casual jobs and precarious uh, catch, uh, nature of wage labor. And the second case is like it's about the missing tribal community. Uh, the missing tribal community, uh, historically, they uh, share their livelihood is tied with the riverine ecology and uh, riverine ecology. Uh, so, increasing nature of uh, the annual floods and riverbank erosion forced them to move away from their uh, riverbanks. So, as a result, they are disconnected from the their their uh, historical culture. So, when we talk about the other communities, other marginalized communities stay at the mature areas. 
they are also forced to move away from the riverside to other interior parts of Majuli. Um, then we will discuss the case of uh, women across the mar uh, marginalized communities. Uh, they, as a response to the livelihood crisis, they mostly engage in small scale handloom weaving, handicrafts making. Uh, and uh, these self help groups play an important role there. And uh, we can see all the, the marginalities highly related to the uh, their vulnerability to floods also. Like the geographical location of the uh, river, river side community uh, make them vulnerable to annual floods and related hazards. While Assamese community settled in the core of the uh, core areas of Majuli and they are kind of less impacted by the floods. So, given this scenario, the uh, question arises what inland water transport can do to uh, provide a sustainable livelihood to the local communities. So, moving on, uh, one of the recent infrastructure development happening at Majuli is uh, construction of a bridge which entered into the local development imagination in multiple ways. First is increasing connectivity. Uh, it promises a connectivity to uh, connectivity to outside well, a 24 hours connectivity because uh, now the ferry piles till 3.30 p.m. So they, the local communities are facing problems, especially during medical emergencies, etc. And the bridge promises an increasing accessibility, accessibility in terms of employment opportunities and education opportunities, which uh, mostly they are finding outside of Majuli. Uh, the disciples of New Vaishnavis movement particularly raise the concern uh, about the integration of Majulis culture with other parts of Azam. For example, the a unique culture of Majuli will dilute with other cultures and the increasing number of population may bring more industrial pollution and waste generation, etc. So the women, local women uh, aware of the construction of bridge and uh, they are kind of anxious about what will happen to their uh, small scale business. Will it bring more competition or will it increase uh, access to market opportunities? Because the ferry service, they are kind of afraid, uh, especially during the monsoon season because of the increasing number of accidents, etc. But the question to ponder is about the last mile connectivity. Uh, for example, the char, the communities reside in char areas. Uh, they stay around 20 kilometers away from the construction site of bridge. So a complete shift away from the ferry service to bridge will it reproduce the existing inequality in Madhuri. So uh, based on the field insights. Uh, some long hanging fruits have emerged. First is need to have a multimodal transportation, like uh, a coexistence of build, uh, transport to the bridge and a ferry service, which you can cater to the multiple needs of local communities. Second is a potential for developing sustainable livelihood around tourism. As we discussed earlier, tourism is a budding industry in Majuli. So we can provide a sustainable livelihood around tourism and to overcome the livelihood crisis of local communities. Then uh, third aspect is river and aquatic bio biodiversity through community-based conservation. One of our PhD scholar, Girima Das, uh, particularly working on the, this aspect. So I'll hand it over to Anna Meganam. Yeah, so thank you. So these were the two cases uh, that we have uh, 
Uh, we just made a preliminary visit to these study sites. Of course, a lot needs to be explored. And so the, the next step that we have is a similar kind of uh, recce visit would be conducted in Bangladesh with the help of JJS and um, the CUTS. Um, we will uh, we are also planning for um, policy assessment and uh, we uh, plan to collaborate with CEGIS for the policy assessment part. Um, we uh, also are planning to do a uh, traders meet uh, in collaboration with EC mode in Nepal uh, with support from cuts. And we are also, um, I mean, Fida is here already, maybe he can come in later. So Fida already is working very closely with the Bangladesh government. So the so the idea is to know where are the gaps and how at the policy level, where are the gaps and how can we bring all that nuances we uh, you know found in Majuli and Dhuburi case to the policy level so that uh, you know, these gaps can be bridged. So overall, what we really found is that there's a lot of hype going on, a lot of discussion going on at the bureaucracy level, both in India and Bangladesh. But when we went to the ground, really nothing much was happening. So it was very disappointing for us as well. Uh, we are also planning to explore the possibility of setting up living labs in Majuli. And of course, uh, all of these we would like to discuss with you when you all come uh, for the annual workshop uh, in India in between 4th and the 7th December. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. And this is the picture uh, that uh, Sumit took uh, when we were in Majuli. And I think it's a very beautiful picture. So if you have not yet signed up, you should now open your Excel sheet and put your no name and sign up because this is where we will be uh, bringing you for the field work. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anamika, and uh, all other speakers uh, as well, also for your uh, promotional talk here at the end to invite everybody to this uh, beautiful scenery. Um, in the meantime, several people have um, submitted some questions in the chat, and maybe we can just first start um, addressing some of those questions um, and potentially uh, the persons who wrote these questions could give some further explanation. So the first question that are, was entered into the chat box, to my awareness, uh, was the, 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 the remark from Emanuele, who is interested on the idea of the critical lab. Um, Emanuele, would you give some additional words to well, your written comment. Yeah, no, my um, thanks for all the presentations. I've, I think I've, after listening to Sumit, I was, in, first of all, interested by this idea of uh, critical living lab, because usually living labs, according to my limited knowledge, are, are not so critical. <laughs> but I think one of the reasons is that, because as you say, they, once you open up the, the Pandora box or uh, of power relations, like real conflict might arise. So I was wondering also as a, as a researcher, which role will you take in facilitating, mediating, and how will you do that if those conflicts arise? And there was also reference to um, action research Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you combined the two methods. Yes. Approach. Uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, very interesting question. And you rightly said it's not limited knowledge that living labs are not very power sensitive. <laughs> so it is correct. And that's the reason we particularly, or uh, I, during uh, thinking about it, uh, during our preparation of the research design, I thought maybe it's a good idea to take a step forward. And there were a couple of elements that we wanted to borrow from um, stakeholder uh, uh, platforms, because stakeholder platforms, the way they are designed are specifically for conflict resolution. Um, however, living labs are not necessarily thought about it. They are more technologically driven, uh, at least in the European context, the way they are designed. Uh, they are about to implement things, uh, more cooperation is at the forefront of it, but not necessarily conflict resolution. So what, what we've thought about is because, and that's where the role of action research comes, 
uh, we wanted to test few things before creating Living Labs to really visit places, to talk to people and see what kind of dynamics does exist on the ground. And we could clearly see that there is very strong dynamics between these traders, which uh, Anamika was mentioning about, and the state who wants to promote uh, inland water transport uh, for these big uh, uh, big items like the coals and the boulders, uh, which are usually not done by small and marginal traders. These are done mostly by big traders. What happens to these small boat dwellers then? That's the question arises. And if the bridge comes into picture and all sorts of infrastructure develop, what happens to these uh, local small traders? And how are they going to connect? Because in the policy, there is no, app, there is no clear categorization that you can trade this or you cannot trade that. So why there is a clear uh, preference or action plan towards big uh, traders? So why are these small traders who are still uh, doing their trade domestically could not trade with Bangladesh, for example? And what happens to them when these large traders come into picture? Uh, some of them don't even get access to the main ports. Uh, they are still working on these smaller, uh, without any infrastructure on these ports. To get that knowledge, we did these visits and it will kind of uh, set a path to get that feedback into it, which is the action research part. And then we are going to set up these living labs where there will be questions of these clear power interplay. Of course, there is an uh, aspect of agenda setting there. There is a process of learning, collaborative learning that will be aimed at, but also the design elements. Uh, who are invited to these uh, meetings, uh, what are they informed about, uh, who is inviting them, all these aspects will be considered before we set up these living labs. So they will make it make them a bit more sensitive. I would not say completely take away the power into play because that's impossible, but at least there is a possibility to reduce these uh, power struggles when they come forward in these uh, settings. So that's a bit longer answer to your question because it needs a bit more uh, elaboration, but that was it. Uh, I hope it answered, but we can have more uh, discussion about it later. Thanks, Emmanuel, for the question. Yes, and uh, thank you for your explanation, uh, Sumit. I think uh, quite clear and indeed nice stuff to uh, further talk about. Uh, uh, later. Um, then uh, Jodi Gupta has uh, very uh, uh, specific questions that are also addressed already in um, the chat box. Um, yet, at the same time, I think it's also interesting to think about these very specific um, uh, questions in relations to what is then also the transformations going on in this uh, landscape. Eh? So the, uh, you ask about the, the clearance of the bridge. And so that gives us an idea on what kind of um, transportation, of course, is still able to pass underneath without uh, problems and to have with kind of shipping or is it just then small ships or large ships still? And well, apparently it gives a clearance of 10 meters, which I, d I don't know the vessels that are um, traveling, but maybe Anamika, so is this considered that then still large ships are being able to pass through? I saw a very big cruise uh, ship also in one of the, the, the pictures. Would that still be going able to go through or is 10 meters too low? Yeah, I think, uh, the, so if you saw, uh, so it comes from very up in Varanasi, which is another part, but yes, it is in, uh, you know, it is happening, although what Joydi parks was the frequency, but we really don't know, I don't really know, I don't know, maybe Veena would like to respond to that if she is aware of the frequency of these uh, cross-border cruises. Uh, so maybe Veena, you can come. Just one thing before I go to that, I could see, uh, uh, Leon's question on something similar to what you also spoke about, Yap, and uh, whether these, uh, you know, low hanging fruits in both the places are something that we are connecting with the transformative changes. Uh, for now, uh, I would say yes, because we what how we have not yet connected the links, but how or what we felt when we were in the field, particularly in the case of Dhuburi. Uh, was that, for example, those small traders who were engaged in trading between 
Assam, the state of India, to another state of India, which is Meghalaya, uh, they are the locals of those areas. You know, they are engaged in such, uh, you know, trade. But if you really look at the conditions and the economic conditions, the living standards, they are really, really not good. I mean, you know, every time when flood comes, they have to move. And so there is no really good uh, capital as such with them that they can, you know, take it ahead or they, they become better every year. So what, so the lens that we are putting up here is that if suppose we can advocate for these small traders to also participate in the international uh, river and get engaged in international trade, so but particularly with this bridge coming in, which might actually reduce their trade even within the country. So will it actually help their living conditions? Will, will give them an uplift in terms of economic well-being as well? That is one thing. The other thing is we also feel that that can boost the local economy because a lot of things are produced locally as well in Dhuburi. It's one of the states where you know rice cultivation is very high, and that is also uh, exported to Bangladesh. So, will such trade also boost the economy, local economy, and also bring many more uh, people on board? So that's the lens we are taking. But of course, we have to see how it moves, and I do understand that. Uh, we have to explore more and connect the whether this is going to really bring transformative change. Not now, maybe 10 years down the line or five years down the line, maybe not, of course, during the project period. Uh, similarly for, for uh, Majuli as well. Um, yeah, so I can see Sumit has raised, maybe Sumit, you would like to add something to this? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a very fair question of what is transformative. And I think that's where I started with Leon, that we also have to see what is not transformative. Uh, particularly when we are dealing with these uh, communities in Dhubri, specifically not even Majuli, because Majuli, I still feel the standard of living is quite all right. But in Dhubri, uh, the standard of, is small changes, small changes uh, can be considered transformative. And so the question comes, uh, transformative for whom and how do they understand that change, right? For someone, a small change can be transformative and some for someone, a big change can be considered a very minor thing. So I think it's very relative. And I think within the scope of the project, we have three years now or two and a half. I think we should be also optimizing our efforts in, in the understanding of what it could bring as a change for them. And then, of course, we can connect it with the larger literature and the future of things of how they have evolved. Uh, I think one of the things, this particular aspect, we have clarified in a research note now. Uh, it's, it's a bit longer than I thought of. It has now come out to almost 12 pages of document. Uh, I would really like to share with everyone and see. And we have discussed about the concept of transformation there, but also how we are connecting and trying to achieve this through low-hanging fruits. So I think those kind of uh, answers would be there. The second uh, question that I really wanted to answer was for Joydeep. Joydeep was asking about the frequency of dredging. Uh, we, I don't know, uh, particularly in Dhubri, but it's very often now. That I'm 100% yeah. sure because when we met the IWA officials there, they were saying that the in the upstream of Brahmaputra, from Dhubri, I mean to say, uh, the, there is a channel which particularly needs regular dredging. Uh, so that the, uh, the 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 trawlers can come down and then further move to Bangladesh in case they are doing that. So that's one thing they do very frequently the dredging in the a bit upstream of Dubri, uh, very often so that the channel is clear for them. And they also showed us in the map and everything where they particularly do that. We might have a picture on that. So that's that. Regularly, yeah, that's what yeah, that's what they do it regularly. Vina, yeah, please. <laughs> Yeah, so on the question on cruise movement uh, through protocol route, I think the MB Ganga Villas cruise was, you know, uh, was the one which went to Marjuli right from Varanasi to, uh, you know, the uh, But I think the bookings are done annually for that cruise. So next time it usually coincides with the flood season when the water level is convenient for the big vessel movement and all. So it will happen probably in August, September. Uh, this year. Uh, other than that, there are some other cruise operators also in, in Bangladesh. Um, so they also, um, I mean, it's not very free, uh, frequent, hardly one or two voyages happen, like cross-border voyages happen in the year. That's the case now. 
and um, yeah as as anamika already has already said um so right now <clears throat> so the the upcoming bridge is going to you know displace the 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 small boat uh, owners and those who are engaged in that movement uh, of trade uh, within the state or uh, between Assam and uh, Meghalaya and uh, with the opening of uh, the new trade route or if they can participate in the international trade so that would be an additional opportunity for them and this can bring uh, you know some change in their livelihood and uh, so this is not uh, easy as it is said and there are several regulations involved in it uh, including vessel registration and also the the traders who are interested uh, should have the import uh, export license and all so uh, they are not aware of the procedures and all but uh, uh, are also not clear of the uh, about the picture on the other side of the border and that's why we thought like a you know meeting where we can bring in the traders together because trade is happening but it is through land route now and how much of it can be uh, taken to the river route and how profitable it would be is something which they need to understand and discuss. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. One of the things which was very interesting for us, which we couldn't find an answer, particularly in Dhuburi, was that why, apart from these restrictions, why is uh, the small traders not really getting access to the to the, the international port. I mean, what I'm saying is that, well, if they see that there is potential, they will be able to, uh, you know, put pressure on the government, at least the local government that, you know, we also want to be a part of it. That was the time we realized that trade is already happening, but it's more informal. So they don't really bother because their work somehow is happening. But what is not happening now is not formalized. It's very informal, which they don't like to talk. They're not supposed to do this trade ideally. So we also couldn't really document it as such. But yeah, informal trade between India and Bangladesh is happening through one point from where it goes by road transport, not through uh, uh, water. So yeah, we have to explore more on that as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, many questions. Uh... <clears throat> Also come in in my mind, but I would like to to give uh, give the floor also to other people uh, if there are still other questions from word here with us. There are some questions from Joydeep, which I think I have responded to each of these. Uh, I think so. Let me see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, please, uh, Joydeep. Uh, if you want to add something. Uh, yeah, I know Anamika has responded to almost all of them. There's one, I think I didn't make myself clear in the question. So it was um, basically, it's it's coal and stone that's being moved. So mm -hmm. what? Uh, so who, where is the coal being mined or whatever? And who's buying it? Bhutan, India, Bangladesh, who's buying? Who's selling? And stone, who's uh, doing the query? who's buying you mean to say between countries who is buying yeah so is bangladesh buying the coal from india or from bhutan yes, yes. yeah and what about so, the stone same thing stone is coming from bhutan so it's bhutan to bangladesh via india no no bhutan to india to bangladesh right uh, yeah okay uh, so the querying so is there any any are there any goods in the other direction? What does what's Bangladeshi? What are the Bangladeshi boats no, doing? No, nothing. No, nothing. Empty. empty. That's <laughs> the most interesting. They come empty, they is... collect, and then they go. That's very interesting. But Joydi, there's one more thing, Anamika. You remember when we went? They are saying that the stones are coming from Bhutan, but actually they are not coming from Bhutan. They are coming from the lower ridges, which are called Bhutan, but they are India. Now, they, the reason they do that is that they lower their taxes. So there is a lot of informality there. Yeah, because I can the see stones it. that would Enormous. come from Bhutan are cheaper. Yeah. But they are actually yeah. Indians, Indian stones. Yeah. I, yeah. I can see a lot of res resistance to formalizing all this. Yes. <laughs> so, so that's it. It's actually. Yeah, Veena. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, no, it's actually, um, you know, both ways. Um, stone is coming from Bhutan and stone is also collected from 
parts of uh, you know north bengal yeah. and yeah. sometimes it is also labeled as it is coming from bhutan to avoid tax and um a lot of informalities are there uh, in the trade happening between india and nepal yeah. and and on the question on vessels coming uh, uh, from Bangladesh. So right now the entire, uh, you know, uh, all the vessels are uh, Bangladeshi vessels and they are coming empty. So uh, once an effort was taken to bring cotton waste, um, you know, while they are coming to India. So there are a lot of co cotton waste is of high demand in Assam side and it comes from Bangladesh. But since it was done for the, in the first time and there were some um, custom compliance and and other issues so it was stuck for almost one month and hence the traders were you know uh, very upset about it and they're very skeptical to go again but this is one thing which uh, which is very promising and which can come uh through water waste cotton waste uh, from bangladesh side yeah yeah Then uh, I'm, I'm going to still pose uh, one of the questions that popped in my mind, because um, in your presentations, you also mentioned that this bridge is pre presented as something to contribute to cultural integration between these different groups. Therefore, I was thinking, is this part of a, uh, a national narrative of, well, maybe well, as, as, as an India national kind of thing and of cultural integration? Or is it also more prevention? Uh, so, what is the maybe that higher level transformative idea of one united India? Or I well, I, I see hats going. Yeah, so I think you understand what my question talk about is. This, but the, whatever came to your mind as a bulb is the right thing to ask. So, Sumit, go ahead. <laughs> I hope I don't say anything offensive on this uh, channel, but current populist government in India is based on two things. Their agenda sets on two things. One is to create infrastructure to show that, that there is tangible development. And second is polarization. And they both work wonderfully in both the places. Uh, Dubri uh, is a place where there are traditionally uh, people from Bangladesh who have moved to India, not anymore. So this is, there is always a narrative around it that people are still coming. It's absolutely not correct. But in the past that has happened. And so that's one of the reasons they have been kind of secluded and kept in that part of it. So you will see the kind of indicators, the development indicators are very, very, I would say, they're not doing great in that part of uh, the country. Uh, second, the bridge, in Majuli has a different story. Uh, there have been several accidents that have happened in River Brahmaputra where people have lost their lives. And there have been several efforts to build uh, this bridge uh, because it's a river island and it keeps moving. We don't know how technically it is feasible to build such a bridge. Uh, I'm sure there is technological advancements and everything, but the impact uh, assessments of such projects have been completely kept classified. We have had no access to it. Even the DPRs for such projects uh, are not accessible in public uh, for public information. So you can imagine what is going on behind uh, the scenes to showcase that how development is happening in India how the, uh, the infrastructure development is happening, but along on the lines of polarization, whenever there is an opportunity, and Assam is particularly uh, a prime example of uh, polarization between the Hindus and the Muslims. And one of the sites we have chosen, Dubri, is uh, categorically representative of that. Yeah, can I it just- It's very well in the narrative of what uh, the government is trying to do. Just one line to what Sumit is saying that, but there was a demand from people of Majuli for a bridge that has always been there because that was before even this government came because they have faced a lot of problem because of very lack of connectivity. So the question that we want to understand is that given the fact that there is already a bridge going to be there, how is then inland water navigation going to enhance their livelihood or how, why are you then focusing so much on the inland water navigation when somebody can reach the place much easier than traveling for so many you know, hours? So that's something we thought that would be interesting to explore. And so we are looking at it more from a multi-modal uh, you know, form of uh, uh, transportation. 
Yeah, there's one more thing about the bridge. It's of course there's a demand, but it is contested, and it is yet contested, uh, still contested. Yeah, so let me, about... let me, uh, sorry, just go in between, because um, what I find interesting, how I also hmm. realize in this in this uh, story that you tell, so a bridge often is of course presented as something that is connected, bridging a gap and bridging community, all that kind of. Um, but it reminded me maybe of a picture that you also know in some of uh, uh, workshops that you see um, a deer crossing a road. And mm. then people ask you, what do you see on this picture? Yeah. And then people will say, I will. Most of the people will say, I see a deer crossing a road. And then the facilitator will tell you, no, you see a road that crosses the home of yes. a deer. Um, and so with the bridge, maybe also the barrier that crosses the river. Rather it it than, has. Um, it, so I I like that the, the bridge, well, of course, has this analogy, but it also pushes us now in this transformation to maybe look differently when we look at the inland water transport on what is maybe the, the, the barrier created here across mm -hmm. this river and who is then um, winning, losing, and what is transformation then? Uh, going on so that i that was the idea that sparked in mind no you're right resonated no you're yeah. you're absolutely right just one thing to add we have only talked about uh one river island which is majuli and dubri is of course a bigger region but you know there are maybe hundreds of river islands there and how many bridges are you going to construct to connect yeah. these river islands. That's the question that comes at the end. So I think there is a lot to think about when we talk about these bridges and they are absolutely contested, but let's see what the future unfolds for the people uh, after decades and decades of uh, protest of having the bridge or not having the bridge. Thank you. Um, with that being said, I th also look at the time. It's uh, 10 past uh, our ending time. Local differences uh, included. Um, to be very frank, I do not have the schedule in front of me for our next meeting, for our next time. So I'm unable to tell that by heart um so therefore i leave it uh with that for this moment to so thank you everybody uh for participating in this webinar soon um next week we will have some um uh webinar sessions around uh, the the learning uh in in this project so on monday 22nd there will be two webinars based on the time zone so in the for me in the Netherlands, it will be in the morning and the late afternoon and in um, uh, the Thursday as well in um, for the, the Dutch and Kenya partners around uh, midday. Um, so thank you everybody for that. Maybe Leon or Anamika on behalf of the Project League, do you want to say something? Otherwise, I'm going to thank you everybody for your participation and thank you, Kakma Putra Note, for your very interesting and inspiring presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.